I did this. Um, Smart Energy Initiative of Southeastern Pennsylvania is one of the five. They also have one in IT, ITAG. So if any of your companies have IT people, you might want to make them aware of the ITAG industry partnership. All of the partnerships are free to join. There are no membership fees. Even the Chester County Economic Development Council, which I'll get into in a moment, does not have a membership fee. Uh, they look for investors. Uh, we help literally hundreds of companies every year with the primary mission of helping you grow your business. And while we are based here in Chester County, we are a nonprofit. We are not a government agency. We've been around about 64 years. Gary Smith is the president and CEO. Mike Brigalonis is the COO. And I was a volunteer for ITAG 20 years ago. I was working for an IT consulting firm, and I joined their membership committee, so I had another reason to talk to potential recruits and potential clients. After 10 years of volunteering for ITAG, the then vice president of workforce development, many of you know here at FD Vincenzo, tapped me on the shoulder and said, Jim, if we paid you, could you give me like eight hours a week to make this, this, and this happen? And um, I did. That was to work for, for ITAG. Went home to the wife at the time, not married anymore. And she said, are oh, you get paid to go to all those meetings you've been going to for all these years? And I went, well, some of them. And, and I came inside, and I counted 63 different initiatives being done underneath this group with about 25 full-time employees and about another 25 part-time subcontractors. And I'm like, that's not possible. And they were all being done well. So this January, I'll be, cons I'll be celebrating 20 years as a management consultant. And, and looking back at it, I was like, how can this possibly be? And the secret is twofold. They have outstanding leadership, and the people that are here are very passionate about what they do. They, many of them have come from the private sector and are involved in different segments of the industry. Uh, Jody Gawker, for example, runs our agriculture partnership, which is another one. She and her husband are farmers, and that's the passion that they bring to this. The other industry partnerships, in addition to energy, IT, and agriculture, are healthcare and manufacturing. So the secret is we have between 600, I'm sorry, between 400 and 600 volunteers that get to work for us. And many of you in the room are volunteers, both for the energy <laughs> partnership as well as the manufacturing partnership. So the Economic Development Council, in addition to workforce development, which is what the industry partnerships are primarily doing, trying to help you improve your workforce through education and through training, they also help companies with financial solutions. And part of today's program is going to go into some of the financing specifically around energy projects. Um, helping you find a better location or a new location for your for your business. Uh, we just a couple of weeks ago had a, a company in from Germany that's looking to expand to the United States and you're looking at the base here. We don't do a lot of outbound reach. We really try to help the companies that are here already expand. And I wish Gary Smith was doing the presentation this morning because he has his long history of 44 years of working with us and he tells such stories of when he helped Vanguard pick out their first plot of land before Vanguard was even a company. Or how he took people down to what was at the time an abandoned Commodore 64 warehouse and it became the QVC Studios. So these are the types of things in terms of location services. We also, for the last 10 years, later this month in October, our I2N group, Ideas Times Innovation, is going to be celebrating their 10th year. And they are a group of uh, helping startup companies around, usually biotech and tech, but other areas as well. So if you have a need, whether you're in Chester County or not, 52% of the companies we deal with are outside of Chester County, and um, we don't look at county boundaries. After we're done today, we will be emailing you a survey. It's very important to us. We apply for grant monies and try to keep these programs up and running which is another way we can keep the memberships free. And they want to know, well, what did the people think of what you put on? So score us honestly, but please score us, because that's very important to you. With that, I want to introduce Steve Krug. I know many of you know Steve. Steve is one of our many volunteers. He is currently the chair of SEI. And Steve, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thanks for all your hard work. I really appreciate all the support we get here at CCEDC. Smart Energy Initiative has been around for Quite some time. It's great to see some old 
familiar faces here in a full house and some new faces. I really am happy to see new faces here as well. So, uh, how about those Phillies? <laughs> in the, in the postseason, that's great. So, um, I am an architect and an engineer. Uh, I've specialized in energy efficiency throughout my career. I chair the uh, climate change advisory committee for the state of Pennsylvania. Also, sit on a bunch of other committees. But here at the Smart Energy Initiative, we support, as the initiative, the industrial partner of CCEDC, the development of energy related companies. So, uh, our big, what we're really well known for is training. Training sessions like today, the seminars that we have put on, where we bring experts in to talk about uh, important items. We have industrial, we have uh, three, or no, four um, specific work groups geothermal, energy efficiency, solar, and uh, natural gas. Um, so they meet to, uh, regularly, and we'll be meeting. Kevin, when are we going to meet? Uh, November. November. At those work groups, that's when we generate all the ideas for the seminars that we want to do all year and all the support that we need. We also offer funding for specific training for energy companies to get grants through the Department of Labor and Industry. And uh, in the past week, we uh, trained uh, some close to 20 people on geothermal. And we offer uh, uh, funding to help pay for that training. So if you have any training that your company is doing, be it solar training, even IT training, uh, but it's related to your energy business here in Pennsylvania, we can help fund that training up to 50 percent. I want to thank all the uh, volunteers for SEI, and uh, in particular, I want to thank our sponsor, Spot Stevens and McCoy. I know we have a few people here from there, and thank you very much. Spot Stevens and McCoy is an engineering and environmental survey firm uh, with local and global clients. They worked on many projects with me, uh, both their civil and uh, MEP work. Uh, they have a vision for a cleaner, safer, healthier, faster, smarter, closer, more modern, more efficient, more useful <laughs> future. More of everything. More of everything. Uh, the vision of Spot Stevens and McCoy is the practical energy solution. Uh, and they specialize in energy and sustainability services. Uh, and Paul is here from Practical Energy. Um, we appreciate all their support that they, they bring to us. So with that, I hope we have an exciting program, part two of the path to net zero. And Mike will cover uh, our Mike is our program chair for Smart Energy. Mike Brown. And um, I know the eye is watching, but is anyone online or do we, can we turn our back? You may turn your back now. Oh, good, good. Online. Glad everyone came in person. Yeah, and those speaking too, we were talking about not, you can just use the room here. So, um, yeah, Mike Cromer, uh, Vice President Energy and Sustainability for Pannoni. Um, Pannoni, um, you know, going to the end of last year was actually uh, in the energy space, EPC and design builder. Um, you know, which now focused, got out of EPC and brought our energy um, auditors, energy engineers, and, and all those folks into our MEP group, which is fairly large. We service um, industrial, commercial, institutional. So um, audits, management, distributed gen, um, alternative fuels, EV vehicles. Um, so we're, we're focused on that, blending that work with our big MEP practice that we have already. So thank you for that. And, um, yeah, we have a great lineup for you. Um, I'm going to read three bios. I'll just get them all out of the way now. So starting with Jim Kurtz. Uh, Jim's the founder and president of RER Energy Group, uh, combining business development and management expertise experience with expertise in finance. Jim Kurtz launched RER Energy Group in 2009 to harness the power of the sun and to strengthen community there. Jim and his team focus on educating customers and developing solutions to maximize their savings with solar and energy storage solutions. This customer-centered approach has led to tremendous growth, recognized leadership in the industry in over 125 projects across 14 states, including Mexico. 
clients include Boscovs, the Episcopal Diocese of Rhode Island, and Penn State University, to mention a few. Jim Byrne is MBA uh, from Harvard Business School and worked in New York City in the financial services industry before helping his family's electrical contracting business expand into the solar industry. We'll go on to the next one. Um, followed from Jim will be Scott White. Scott's the principal at Holstein White Engineers. Uh, Scott has been designing commercial and institutional facilities for over 30 years, where he has contributed a great deal to the development and implementation of geothermal heat pump technologies. He has successfully applied these systems in educational, municipal, commercial, and residential buildings. The results have yielded exceptional buildings with low operating costs to satisfied owners. He has become one of the nation's foremost experts in water source and geothermal water source heat pump system design. His thorough understanding of HVAC systems has given him the ability to generate designs, often substantially reducing construction material and labor costs and exceeding efficiency requirements. He's earned an excellent track record in designing optimal HVAC systems and introducing new ideas to address owners' needs and code requirements. Following Scott's presentation, we're, we're happy to have uh, Nuveen Green Capital with us. It'll be Sheila Wallace. Um, she's a director of, of Originations for Nuveen uh, Green Capital. She's 15 years of experience in commercial real estate. Uh, prior to joining Nuveen Green Capital, Sheila had various lending roles, including commercial real estate lending specialist for Capital Bank, VP of commercial real estate loan officer for Bancorp Bank, and senior investment analyst for PGIM Real Estate Finance. Additionally, Sheila spent many years working as an advisor to commercial real estate developers, adding in, uh, and structuring their JV partnerships and helping to raise debt and equity. Sheila received her bachelor's in economics from the Wharton undergraduate program at the University of Pennsylvania. We welcome all three uh, presenters. I guess we'll flip back to who's going to start here, Sherry. We have um, RER, sir. All right, back to Jim. We'll do Q&A at the end. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll run through all three presentations, right? We'll bring everyone back up and just hold your questions to the end. Okay. That is geothermal. Oh. That's Scott. Yes. We did that uh, bio laid off to check that. We haven't made Mexico a state yet, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> look at that. Um, Thank you so much, yep. and, and Steve, and uh, um, boy, these programs are just terrific uh, for all of us. We learn so much, and really appreciate the get, chance to get to talk here I, and, and have a dialogue. I uh, want to call out SSM, Spotsy McCoy. They've been our go-to engineering partner for, gosh, 10 years. Patrick McCoy, who heads it up, and uh, Rick Martin, the electrical engineer, is our go-to uh, guy. We, How many states have you been to? <laughs> For a strict, I mean, it's uh, uh, several. Not, not to Mexico. <laughs> not to Mexico yet, but uh, um, probably a hundred projects or so that Rick has, has invested with us, and uh, just uh, excellent, excellent services. We really appreciate all the guys. Do you like the What a, what a good time to have a conversation. You know, we like to say customers don't go forward unless there's pain in the market. And uh, there is pain in the market right now with energy prices. Uh, and uh, you know, the government has, has created this uh, campaign of we're giving out funds for renewable energy projects through the Inflation Reduction Act. So people have pain. Um, people know that there's programs out there. Hopefully today we'll share a little bit about what we're seeing, what's going on, and it's helpful for your areas of focus. And uh, we'll, we'll dive right in. And, and yes, um, I have more of a finance background. I have a partner who's a master electrician. We've been working together for about eight years, Michael Barnes. And um, we really do just enjoy talking to customers, understanding you know, what their pains are for energy. We focus on commercial and industrial projects, not residential, not utility scale. So we're in that you know, school district, municipalities, businesses, market. Um, and so that's the perspective that I'll be sharing with you today, what we're seeing going on in solar in that environment. Uh, we'll talk about the goals that organizations have, certainly trying to reduce costs, um, but there are revenue opportunities. Municipalities can lease land for utility scale projects. Uh, we'll talk about on-site solar versus remote arrays, 
know, how do you evaluate on-site opportunities? What's your capacity with some financing? Don't go into too much technology here today, but there are additional slides I think will be shared that go into that. I'm glad to answer questions today, tomorrow, whatever. Um, and why so now? Prices are up. There's a big program. Um, the details are not out yet, but directionally we know where it's going. So we'll uh, keep on going. So why are organizations looking at, what, what do we see people looking, uh, organizations looking at solar for? Again, reducing costs, stabilizing costs is, is a big factor. It's energy prices all over the board. You have polar vortexes, you have what's going on in the energy markets with Ukraine and everything. So stabilization can be as, as important as reducing. Um, aligning consumption with sustainability goals is a key aspect and generating revenue. Um, we're uh, seeing batteries now being uh, a good opportunity in different states, just to just like organizations would put up cell towers and get leasing, now batteries are a new leasing opportunity, depending where you're located in your nearest substation. So you know, it's not just about reducing costs, there's revenue opportunities. What are different approaches for solar? You know, most clients look to on-site solar first, and we advocate for that. It is the cheapest form of energy when you can own the system and have it on your site. Um, but that's tier one. Uh, the next tier is, and, and, and but along, along those lines, we're gonna talk about different financing solutions. Even if you are a municipality, you haven't thought about ownership uh, historically, um, we definitely advocate to try to get um, ownership as soon as possible. It is the lowest cost of energy that you can get. There are ways to, to get that ownership. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, Pennsylvania does not have community solar, but clients look to kind of community solar programs. Next, uh, we, we saw Target um, present, and uh, you know, they said that they're getting, you know, they're doing solar in all their stores, and, and getting as much energy as they can that way, maybe 35% of their energy needs they can get with on-site solar. Um, then they look to community solar next, and then they do virtual PPAs. So it's kind of a, a tiering approach. Um, again, Pennsylvania, hopefully we'll have community solar someday. You've been saying that for years. So that was Target Big Box stores. Target Big Box stores. So that's their strategy. That's their strategy, yeah. yeah. To get to net, net zero. To get to net zero, to get to net zero. Yeah. Remote PPAs are a way to get energy benefits from something that's not on site. Um, they're very tricky, very sophisticated. You see larger organizations doing remote PPAs or kind of financial hedging um, structures. They're, they're very, very sophisticated. So that's kind of a third tier um, as opposed to on site first, community solar second. Uh, then Again, uh, this leasing plan for either community solar, utility scale projects, or energy storage. So that's kind of the hierarchy that we see clients going through. Uh, next slide. Just to give a little perspective on uh, spacing aspects, people often say, well, how much can I get with my property? So if you have a, a hundred, if you have 10,000 square feet, that's about 60 kws to 120 kw of solar or you know people want to understand how many kilowatt hours 72,000 to 144,000 kilowatt hours we have a, a slide in a, a second that talks about the difference between kw and kwh um, <coughs> ground about two acres it gives you 300 kw to 500 kw to 390,000 650,000 again this on-site solar if you Look at what your space allows for you. Um, this gives you the lowest cost of, of, of energy. Um, no out-of-pocket options exist for on-site solar, and it, in these contracts are a simpler structure than a, than a remote PPA. Um, if we go to the next slide, just for basic building blocks of knowledge, most people in this room probably understand that a kilowatt is a measurement of power and a moment of time. The sun shines and how many kilowatts you get at a moment of time, as opposed to when you're looking at your bill, you pay mostly in kilowatt hours, which is a measure of energy over time. And, uh, you know, 
one kilowatt hour is 10 100 watt light bulbs left on for one hour. That gives you a little bit of a, a equation on, on that. Um, there are kilowatt charges on the bill as well, peak demand charges, but um, most of the time when we're sizing a solar array for a client, we're trying to understand how many kilowatt hours do they have, and we translate the capacity for solar at the moment in time to how many kilowatt hours over the year. In Pennsylvania, Southeast Pennsylvania here, for every kilowatt of capacity for a moment in time, when the sun shines over the course of the year, you get about 1150 to 1350 kilowatt hours for every kilowatt of capacity. So that's just some basic building blocks um, that uh, hopefully is helpful. Next slide. Really nice part about Pennsylvania solar. Um, there is remote metering from the standpoint of if you have a facility that can put more solar capacity than you need at that site, but you have other sites nearby, say a school district, uh, we've done a couple of those, where you put a large ground array or roof array on one property, you can oversize it and, and allocate the excess generation for that location to other locations if you're within two miles as the crow flies. So that is a policy that uh, some other states do not have, so it's something to keep in mind. Um, and another nice aspect, um, only as of a couple of years ago, you could um, implement this with putting a new meter on. More than two years ago, you had to have an existing meter in order to do this. But uh, there, was a, some, there, was, there was a suit filed, and, and uh, now the outcome of that suit is that you can put a new meter in. And that's... That's, that's helpful for a lot of school districts and other places that don't have, they have a field, but they didn't have a meter there. Now you can put a new meter in, put a large array there, and remote meter to different facilities within a two mile radius. So that's a, you know, it's all about the details of every state is different. There's no solar industry in the United States. There's 50 industries <laughs> within each state. You have different regulations by utility, um, but this is another, another building block of solar knowledge for Pennsylvania. Next slide. Yeah, it's always interesting to think about uh, how much energy can be captured or is being lost. Uh, you know, if you have two acres of field and you put that 500 kilowatt array on that two acres, you know, I drive by and I say, myself, that field there that's kind of barren or you know, rocky, there's no farming, that's capturing $267,000 of value over a five-year period that's not being soaked up right now. That, that, it's throwing grass or whatever it's doing, but it's missed, missed opportunity. 10 years, $556,000. 30 years, $2 million. A lot of money. Um, the economics of solar are tend to be attractive when it works. It doesn't always work. Your roof might not support it. You might have wetlands in your field, so it doesn't always work. <laughs> but when it works, when you look at the cost to put solar in versus the energy that's accumulated over time, you know, these values are calculated assuming a rate of eight cents a kilowatt hour. We used to see five, six cents in Pennsylvania. We're seeing eight or higher with most clients in Pennsylvania. We see 12. Um, and, you know, this is what you're paying for your energy, which is only going up. When you look at the effective cost of solar, how much do you spend for this contraption that's, that creates this energy, and look at maintenance costs over time, you look at all those costs divided by how many kilowatt hours you get over time, the cost per kilowatt hour for solar, two cents, three cents, or something like that, versus paying eight cents, which grows over time. This is why IRRs are 10% or higher, um, mostly in Pennsylvania today. Um, where can you buy a stock that gives you a, a known return of 10% every year for 30 years? You know, stocks have all kinds of volatility. <laughs> Solar is a predictable rate of return. It's a remarkable contraption, uh, it's reliable. 
people that use solar do more solar. I love solar, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun. You can sell something you believe in. Uh, so the, num the numbers are compelling. If it works, um, it doesn't work for a lot of people, roof structural issues, wetlands, and so forth. But when it works, it's very, very effective. Next slide. So how do you realize this? Yes, we advocate the cash purchase that gives you the lowest levelized cost of energy over time. Um, but you have responsibilities. Um, you have to pay the, you know, if something goes bad, um, you got to pay for it. You're responsible uh, for the operations. Of course, you can contract with a company like ours to do it. And, and people who do solar do more solar, but you know, there are responsibilities when you own it. If you buy it, you get the depreciation benefits. Um, so in non-taxpaying entities, sometimes historically have not done this path because of that. Um, I put internal rates return of 5 to 15%. We're really seeing 10 or higher. Just, I just did a presentation last night. That's 18. Uh, energy prices keep going up. <coughs> that return is if you buy the system all in cash, people don't spend all in cash. They put 20% in or something, and then they get a loan or seat based financing. And I know we'll talk more later today about seat based financing, a wonderful low cost financing strategy. So um, there are two it's, it's a low cost. Um, you're responsible for OM costs, you get depreciation, your credit status impacts how long your loan can be. Um, either one of those paths are, are good low cost. Power purchase agreements. You pay more historically, you pay more for energy. This is where you have a third party finance it. And you, the organization that wants energy, enters into a contract with somebody saying, please build my solar array, please build a solar array. We'll buy all the energy that comes from that array at an agreed upon price, typically historically 10 to 20% would be lower than your cost. And those are great propositions. Hey, school district, cut your bill by 20%. Get into a fixed contract for 25 years or so. Um, you get a 1%, 2% escalator market. Who knows what it's going to be? They've been attractive. And you don't have the responsibility of, of, of maintenance and, and, and so forth. But <coughs> that's the world of the, the past 12 years that we've lived in. We have a major, major development with the Inflation Reduction Act. And for the first time, nonprofits have a direct pay option to monetize this investment tax credit, which is basically 30% or higher um, that this new legislation is put in. So before, nonprofit organizations couldn't utilize this tax credit. Now you can send in uh, this form to the government and you'll get the tax credit in cash. And so we are expecting nonprofit organizations to take advantage of this, get that cash, and then borrow the rest of the funds for the project to do it. So it's really going to be a new world. Um, and we'll all see what the final details are. The Treasury is going to come out with the final guidelines Q1, Q2 of next year. Um, there's all kinds of different details that we can go into if you're, if you're curious. Um, you get 100% of the ITC. If your pre-construction is, if your construction begins before 2024, then 90% if it's in 2024, 85% in 2024. We're trying to incentivize people moving forward fast. Uh, after 2024, can we go to 2025 and go to zero? Unless you meet domestic content requirements or if it's under megawatt. There's so many details you could go into. Just um, take away the uh, aspect of these. The situation is dynamic. The rules are coming out. Um, we glad to talk through any individual situation. I have another slide. I think it's next. <laughs> I will try not to get into, into too much of the weeds here. To communicate the complexity of this new legislation and the variety of options that exist for what your tax credit may be. Um, before this legislation, the tax credit in 2022 was going to be 26 was 26 percent. Next year was going to be 22 percent. The legislation basically says it's going to be 30 percent the next 10 years if you meet one of these three criteria. If your project is less than a megawatt, 
you get the 30 percent if you start construction within 60 days after the treasury regulations come out q1 or q2 or if you pay prevailing wage you would get 30 percent if you don't meet one of those three criteria your tax, tax credit is really six <laughs> percent but most people are going to pay the prevailing wage to get 30 percent so essentially you're you you're probably going to get 30%, unless you meet some of these other criteria, which would make the tax credit higher than 30%. If you have domestic content, your tax credit goes from 30 to 40. What is domestic content? We're going to find out. <laughs> it's stated 100% of your steel and iron has to be domestically produced. 40% of your other components have to be domestically produced. What does that mean if it's all manufactured and assembled in the United States, yes. If it's manufactured abroad but assembled in the US, is that domestic? We don't know yet. So um, it's hard to count on this domestic content adder. Treasury guidelines are going to come out Q1, Q2 next year. There's another adder. This is big for Pennsylvania. If your project is an energy community, uh, it qualifies as energy community, you get another 10%. How do you get that? If you meet one of these three criteria, if you're in a brownfield area, uh, is that federal or state brownfield determination? We'll find out. Uh, but that's one. This is an example, by the way, of some projects that we're looking at. We're kind of <laughs> going through with our clients. What do we think the tax credit's going to be? And it's a range. Just trying to give you a flavor of some of these details. But why is this important for Pennsylvania's Energy Community Act? Um, this third one here. If your project is in a census tract where either in that census tract or an adjacent census tract, uh, a coal mine or coal plant has been retired, you get another 10%. Most of Pennsylvania, at least northern and western Pennsylvania, qualify for this. Um, so that's, that's a big, you get another 10%. Uh, another way to get the energy community adder is if <laughs> If the unemployment in your area is above 3.7 um, and your employment in the area is at least 0.17% fossil fuel uh, oriented or 25% of the tax <laughs> revenue in the area is in fossil fuels, you need 2A and 2B, then you get the 10%. I'll stop. <laughs> um, too much, but uh, lots of details. Is there an app for that? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not. And it's creating great confusion. The Solar Energy Industry Association, SIA, if you're a member there, they give you a lot of, they give you a map of, of do you qualify for this area? So um, if you're not, if you're in this industry, you want to be a SIA member. Um, last aspect um, for the tax credit, if you're in an area that is low income, look at a new market tax credit map, you get another 10%. If you're doing a community solar array, 50% of your subscribers are low income, you get another 20%. So the, the point is, the tax credit is going to be probably 30 to up to 70%. We expect in Pennsylvania, the tax credit will largely fall in that 40, 50, 60% range. And you can monetize that by sending the government uh, a, a document and getting that back in cash. Wow. Well, you get 40-50% of the, the project covered, and then you borrow the remaining funds, um, your amortization payment is going to be less than your energy costs. So solar in Pennsylvania is going to flourish because of this complexity. So it's mind-numbing, but <laughs> conceptually, that's the biggest takeaway of how these things are going to be financed. Um, I want to be mindful of time. Let's keep going. Um, just a lot of these slides are hopefully educational for you know, leave behind. Um, historically, how the power purchase arrangement work, the user of energy enters into a contract, a third party operates the system and pays, um, pays for all the operations and maintenance. Um, a company like ours, sometimes we finance it completely ourselves. Typically, we get investors and to, to pay for these projects. Investors require 8% cost of capital on average. If you're a school district, municipality, you have a lower cost of capital. And so you can finance it yourself, particularly with the monetization of the ITC, we encourage it. But this is a structure of how PPAs work. Next slide. And 
again, we talked about the tax credit depreciation benefits. You know, that's the last part that if you are a nonprofit and you do it yourself, you don't get depreciation. And depreciation is, at least right now, 100% the first year. So it is, it is a large benefit that a PPA provider can get that a, a nonprofit cannot get themselves. And so this is why we're not sure how much of the PPA market is going to go away because the PPA still has this benefit of, and, and if you are a nonprofit and you do it yourself, you're not going to get that depreciation benefit. We'll see. I think the numbers are compelling enough that nonprofits will do it themselves and will send a paper to the government to get their money back and borrow the rest. But some people may not want to have the ownership, not want to have the responsibility, let the investors get the depreciation benefit. It's a new world coming in front of us. Next slide. Um, in Pennsylvania, there's another value stream that solar provides. Um, Pennsylvania is one of like 30 states that has a solar renewable energy certificate or credit program set up, SREX, where for every thousand kilowatt hours that you generate in solar, you sell that to organizations that need to meet compliance responsibilities, utilities, a certain percent of their energy source has to be renewable in nature, so they have this obligation to meet, and they buy SREX in the market to offset these obligations. There's a supply and demand issue, and these SREX are traded and have value, and that goes up and down as supply and demand goes back and forth. It's about four cents in Pennsylvania right now. So if you are getting an energy, if you put solar on your facility and you're offsetting your purchasing obligations, you're offsetting eight cents there, basically get another four cents from this SREC market. So complicated, extra value, glad to talk about it more, trying to give you the building blocks of how solar works. Next slide. Here's for pain in the market. <laughs> Low energy prices for a long time, not the world today. We just talking to a client, like, oh, six cents is now at 12 cents. <laughs> what can you do to help us? Um, it's, it, there is real pain in the market. Next slide. Click one more. Um, not going to spend too much time, but in our 12 years of solar, we've seen the price of systems basically fall 80 to 90 percent. <laughs> Been remarkable reduction of costs. Batteries have basically fallen during that time about 50 percent, not as much, but batteries are coming down. And we're seeing more and more organizations look to batteries to get behind the meter value where you can reduce your peak demand charges. You can, some programs, more often in other states than Pennsylvania, time of use differences, where your energy costs are different during different times of day. So you soak up the energy in the low cost periods and deploy the energy at the high periods. Uh, batteries can improve your power quality, which gives you a little bit of backup. There are some incentives in different states, not Pennsylvania. Those are the behind the meter benefits of batteries. There are also what we call in front of the meter batteries. Not only can you reduce your own <coughs> internal costs, but you can discharge energy into the grid and get value from the grid um, in different ways. There are demand response programs. These wholesale markets are set up. There's things called capacity values and ancillary uh, service values. So this is a very, very complicated uh, part of energy. Um, management. <coughs> this is coming big time. We we just um, developed and sold a battery project in Virginia. Um, a New York State utility bought it, and uh, they're saying, "Send us more of these um, batteries are here." And it's a very interesting. And and this is the other biggest news bulletin in terms of the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, before the Inflation Reduction Act, the batteries had to be supported by seven. <coughs> Five percent of the energy had to come from solar when you charge the batteries in order to get a 30% tax credit for the batteries. That's no longer the case. You can get a 30% tax credit on a battery system if it's a standalone battery today. And, and we've heard people say 20% of battery projects worked before, 80% <coughs> of battery projects work. This is a big news bulletin for battery. So, uh, technology company here in Chester County put in a Higher, higher, uh, low, 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 low. Uh, for resiliency and, and demand. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's happening. It's just 
is it is happening. We have a lot of people looking at it. The, you know, reducing your peak demand charges, Pennsylvania demand charges, eight dollars, ten, five dollars, somewhere in that range. California, you're in the twenties. Massachusetts, you're in the twenties. So you don't have quite the same value in Pennsylvania, but to that point, it, it is happening. Next slide. So. Um, <laughs> Solar can be confusing, can be overwhelming, but um, there's great value in it. Uh, we advise clients, first, look at your facility. Does on-site solar or storage work? Look at your current costs versus what's the cost to implement solar, whether you're paying for it yourself or you use third party, we'd be glad to help evaluate the, the options on that. Um, don't forget that maybe you have a contract that right now, it's based on the old world of energy that is expiring. We have lots of clients that are like, our five cents is going to go about up to 10 cents next year. <laughs> We're trying to make plans today. We had a five-year contract, but it's expiring. If your contract is expiring, your rates are going to go up. Um, more factors of today versus tomorrow and battery costs are going to fall. Shoe positions are a big deal that a lot of people don't think about. And um, a way to think about that is say you have a home in a cul-de-sac where there's five homes and you see that your one neighbor across the street puts a solar array in and it was a good deal for them. It was low cost to, to connect with the grid and then a second one does it. Maybe the third, fourth, or fifth home that wants to do solar, when they contact that same utility and say, it's now time for me to do solar, the utility would say, oh, hey, sorry, your other two neighbors took the available capacity to connect at that part of the neighborhood. Now you, the third or fourth one in the neighborhood, have an extra, you know, 50% charge on your whole system costs, tens of thousands. In our world, in the CNI space, hundreds of thousands. It matters to get in the queue sooner rather than later because capacity for connection gets filled up. In our world, one of the first things we do when we look for a site is What's the queue? What does the queue position look like? It's a big deal. And um, utility and utility reform is happening and, and that world might evolve. But um, you might think, I'm going to wait to do solar because I've heard costs are coming down. Um, we think that's a bad idea, not just because we're biased, <laughs> but it's bad for you because um, those queue positions get filled up and your costs get higher over time. This is a big point. So you switch from renting energy, you know, you're paying third parties, you're kind of renting it, to owning energy producing assets by that mousetrap that produces energy. If you are planning to live in a home for uh, 10, 20, 30 years, do you rent or do you buy? You buy the house because it's a lot cheaper to buy rather than to rent. Stop renting your energy, buy this, this contraption that produces energy for a low cost of one to two cents over time, you will save a lot of money. Can you take advantage of remote options if you don't have a good site for on-site? Yes, virtual PPAs, if you're a big user, get help, they're complicated. Um, another option, if you check and your roof isn't good and you've got wetlands and your, your, your ground array, you're despondent over not being able to put solar on your premise, have hope, um, community solar, which will allow you to subscribe to Remote Array, is going to come in Pennsylvania sometime, sometime. <laughs> and, uh, uh, all of our sister states other than Ohio have it, and uh, they're, all, they're all thriving. We have a couple of community solar projects in uh, New York, and uh, we're worried about it. wonder how, what the subscriber rate is going to be. Are people going to stick? Nobody cancels. People get solar energy, and you get credits. You pay, dollar bill, you pay 90 cents to get a dollar bill credit on your, on your bill, people love it. <clears throat> and it's coming to Pennsylvania. So that's another option for you. I hope that information was helpful. Um, solar can uh, go down lots of different angles, but uh, it is fun. It is a, uh, a low cost way of getting energy. And uh, this new world with the Inflation Reduction Act will provide interesting dynamics in, in Pennsylvania. Are uh, we doing questions at the end or? Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Um, before I get started, I just want to understand the audience here. A 
I'm not a member of the council. So do we have mostly engineers, architects, um, building owners? We, yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, so, so can I have a, just a raise of hands real quick? How many engineers or architects do we have here? Uh, building owners? Developers? Contractors? Okay, thanks. Thank you. I just want to see where to lead my discussions. Um, I don't want to bore people with too much technology. Um, the one thing I really want to get across here is geothermal works um, because it's a very simple, simple system. It's basically a heat pump. Uh, I'm sure everyone understands a heat pump. You basically are taking energy. Um, let's say it's in the summer and your house is hot. You're taking that heat. You're putting it in the ground. It's all that you're just pumping it in. Um, in the winter, you have uh, <coughs> heat that's in the ground. You're gonna bring it into the house. Uh, it's a very simple, simple um, technology. Heat pumps have been around for a long time. Geothermal has been around for a long time. It outdates my engineering career. My first geothermal design that I've done was in 30 years ago. The building still operate. It has no issues. It's had some heat pumps changed out. Uh, the water, the, the, the water, I guess, control the water um, uh, process of keeping it treated. That's changed over the years. How do we do that? How do we maintain the water flow in our pipes? That type of thing has changed. The heat pumps have not. Uh, heat pump technology is the same. Refrigerants have changed, but the basic cycle of uh, heat pumps is the same. Okay? The way that we put these systems into the ground is the same. So um, this is not a new technology. Uh, about the last time I gave a talk like this was about 10 years ago. Okay? Um, there's been a lot of new technology that's come out. This new technology has squashed the geothermal and water source heat pump market a little bit. Uh, when I'm talking about technology, VRF, there's other systems that are out there right now that are sort of coming to the mainstream and taking over. VRF is very, very, uh, I guess you say popular right now. There's a lot of changes in refrigerants. It's going to become uh, a little more difficult to use some of these technologies. Um, they're running into issues in Europe right now with the refrigerants. So this system right here has very small amounts of refrigerant. And it uses water. So basically, instead of running large amounts of refrigerant around, we're just running water around a building like almost every building has right now. Um, so what I'm going I'm to start going through some of the technology. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about actually getting these into your building, how easy it is, uh, that it's not very different from a simple water source heat pump building that you would have, um, or a home that you would have a heat pump, split system heat pump. A piece inside, a piece outside. Yes. So the path to net zero, geothermal is an all-electric system. Correct. It gets fossil fuels off the site. Yes. yes. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about the technology a little bit. Um, the main thing with your alternate to a geothermal system, um, I would say maybe let's say 30 years ago, was uh, a water source heat pump. In your building. The water source heat pump would have a cooling tower on the roof and a boiler in your basement. You'd run water through the building to each heat pump. What the geothermal does is it takes the boiler out of the building, takes the cooling tower off the roof. Now all you have is water running through <coughs> the pipes to the heat pumps and into the ground. And that's basically there's nothing else needed in a building. You can even do your domestic water with this. Okay, so it's all, it would be all done through uh, heat pumps and the geothermal. So the biggest thing is uh, what geothermal takes advantage of is the ground, is the earth, okay? The earth is a stable body. When you go down about four or five feet, the temperature of that ground is pretty much uniform year round. Um, around here, it's between 52 and 56 degrees, according to where exactly you are, how much concrete's there, how open of a space, whether it's dirt or not dirt. That, 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 that is uh, absorbing the sun. So you can go to the next. 
So this, it, it's interesting, we were just talking about solar. The Earth's the largest solar collector, okay? It basically takes heat in, in, in the uh, daytime and basically releases it in the evening, okay? So what you have to understand is 47% uh, of, of the sun is absorbed by the Earth, okay? Um, I'm using the word water furnace only because I'm using their slide. So uh, water furnace, uh, geothermal systems, they're able to use that energy, okay, with the pipes that are in the ground to basically transfer heat in and out of a facility, in and out of the ground. So this is in, this is sort of what I was talking about earlier. Um, if you have five degrees outside, and you're trying to uh, use a heat pump, a traditional split system heat pump. You're trying to basically take heat out of five degree air. Very difficult to do. VRF systems that I was talking about earlier have achieved this. They've, they've achieved this by being able to operate the compressors at different speeds, okay? Um, they're not, they, they lose their efficiency as you get to these colder temperatures. They're more like an efficiency of maybe slightly over one, okay? Uh, with the ground, we always have that stable 55 degree uh, source to basically get heat out of and bring it into the house. Uh, in the reverse, in the summer, you have a 90 degree day. Again, you're running a, a compressor, you're, run, you're trying to get the heat out into the air from your building. With 90 degree air, 95 degree air, 100 degree air. If you have an, an, an ever experienced any type of air conditioning system, it doesn't have to be a heat pump. On the hotter days, it's very difficult to get a good air conditioning going on in your building only because of the temperature that's out there. Uh, again, the ground temperature <clears throat> is elevated here a little bit, and I'll talk about that a little later. Now it's going to be, let's say it's 60 degrees. Still a great environment to do air conditioning. Here's where the energy efficiency really comes in. Uh, with, with a heat pump system, you're basically just moving heat back and forth. You're not really creating it, okay? But there is an energy penalty because you have to pump it, just like whenever you're pumping anything. So right here, you have one unit of electricity goes in, you get four <coughs> units from the earth or your source, wherever you're getting that heat or moving that heat, and you get five units of of energy into the house. It's really, it's related to the COP, but the biggest thing that's changed over the years, since 30 years ago when we started doing this, was the efficiencies of the actual heat pump itself and the pumps that are moving the water through the ground. They've been, there's been a lot of research and, and they've gone up in uh, the energy. Back, back when we were first doing this, maybe this number was around two, a little bit higher. It's, it's much better now because uh, just, just technology, uh, the type of compressors they're using, the refrigerants, the, the size and understanding the heat exchangers, all of those pieces right there. So the biggest thing is here, if you have, uh, you know, energies that are, or efficiencies that are around 500% and a gas furnace at its highest level is 98% efficient. So you can just understand how much more efficient it is than a, than, than a gas fired furnace, uh, even electric. So think of electric heat. Electric heat is one KW in, one KW out, if you have a clean electric coil. So you have to remember that's all you're getting. Here you're getting five times that. We can go to the next one. Uh, this is very, very, uh, uh, Confusing maybe, but I just wanted to bring this up just to, so in case anyone doesn't understand the heat pump. Basically, you have a compressor, that's where all your energy goes, and a fan, okay, on the inside of your, uh, on the inside of your building or your house. So all that you're doing is you're moving air across a coil here, a typical split system heat pump, you're moving air across another coil here, and then you have your basic refrigeration cycle. What changes when you go to a geothermal or a water source heat pump? You take out the outside unit, okay? Which everyone understands what a split system sits outside. You get rid of this piece. 
you end up putting a heat exchanger, which usually resides within the in interior heat pump. Okay. You can also have a rooftop unit, which would have all the components in it and just have the water uh, coming out. Okay. This piece right here basically goes right here and you run your typical refrigeration cycle and then you have a pump that runs water through a coaxial heat exchanger. This would then go <coughs> to the ground. For the water source heat pump system that's not geothermal, this would go into your mechanical room, go through boilers and a cooling tower in order for the heat to be exchanged through this heat exchanger. This is just a, a very similar to what I just showed you. Um, the reason I put this here mainly is because when you're doing heating or cooling, the same water runs through here, you use the same heat pump, you just reverse the cycle so that on one side you have an evaporator coil, on the other side is a condensing coil, and when you flip to the heating mode, it just switches. That, that's all that happens. Sort of like if you think about uh, a heat pump, if you went out on a cold day, put your hand over the heat pump, you feel heat coming out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. on a cold day you feel cold coming out. Okay, all you're doing is you're reversing it. You take that uh, cold that's coming out there, you reverse it, now it's cooling inside and you, and you cool your house or your building. Um, now, similar, I'm just taking it to a larger scale where we basically in the cooling mode, we disperse heat into the ground. In the heating mode, we absorb it back from the ground. This is where I was showing you there's a little difference, summer to winter. Uh, your stable ground temperature, let's just say it's 53 degrees. Okay? At the end of a season, that ground temperature may be 55, 56 degrees. Maybe it gets up to 60 degrees, okay? And that is energy being stored in the ground. The one thing that we've learned over the past 30 years is that energy is stored on the ground. If you don't have a properly designed uh, system and it's not spread out, it's not in the right environment, you don't have the, the proper, um, I, I guess you'd say, uh, movement of water, you can heat the ground, and if you're not pulling it back out in the other season, it's going to start to elevate the ground temperature, okay? We've gone back and seen this. We've been brought in to look at buildings that have had this done. Um, simple fixes are they add a little cooling tower to it, they relieve this, this heat that's built up in the ground uh, during like cooler times where it's easy not even to run a fan, but just to let it out of the ground. Uh, where have we seen this in? Um, certain buildings that have, uh, you would traditionally think would be a heating dominated site, they're actually a cooling dominated site. Um, nursing homes, for instance, where you have a lot of traditional gas fire uh, components going on, cooking, laundry, um, fresh air, different things that were done back then with fossil fuels <clears throat> and with other sources other than the geothermal. The goal today in design is to do everything you can with the geothermal system. Get as much as you can from a heating and cooling standpoint into the system because what you find is if you model the system for one year and then you push it out over let's say 50 years we typically all look at this over 50 years what we want to see is a balance so we want to say if we're let's just say we're dumping marbles into a jar okay so we're going to dump so many marbles into the jar now in the reverse season we want to pull them back out of the, out of the jar if we leave any marbles left in the jar that is heat that's left there which is elevated and it's not necessarily a bad thing to have it elevated somewhat so that what what would having too much heat in your system uh, allow for in the future a cold winter a cold spell something where you had it designed at a ground temperature let's say of 53 degrees okay now all of a sudden you have a bad harsh winter and wouldn't it be nice to have 60 degree ground temperature that you can pull from 
yes, that, that, that's a very good uh, uh, sort of situation for you to be in, okay? This is the key to design right now. The rest of the building, um, water source heat pumps, it's a very easy thing, you know, you do your load couch, you look for how big different uh, uh, pieces of equipment are, how much water you have to flow through it, how you're going to get the water to flow through it. Um, over the years, uh, water treatment has grown and gotten so much better. Uh, the lifeline of this system is really not your refrigerant, okay? It's your water and it's your pipe. So you're putting pipes underground and you're running water through. That is what you cannot get to once this is done. It's the most critical piece of this is to make sure that you have stable pipes that are going to last for a long time. We use uh, high density polyethylene pipes. Um, if you took a high density polyethylene pipe and laid it somewhere and just let it sit there, probably a hundred years from now, it would look exactly the same. Be in exact condition, probably barely even tarnished. Okay, so this is what we're putting on the ground. We try to keep as few joints as possible when we put these underground. So when you're thinking of the life expectancy and how long this is going to last, these are the components that are going to fail. There's a compressor in there, okay? Um, when I, I, I've done probably the first building was just about 30 years ago. I think they're just starting to change the compressors, which how many other systems do you just change the compressors? But really, you have compressors and you have pumps that are left after what the, the, the circuiting of piping that you have. Um, do you ever have pipes fail? Yes, and we'll get to that a little later on what can be done when, when something like that might happen. You go there. Um, I guess I jumped the gun a little, but here's just talking a little bit more about how we put energy into the ground and we take it out in different seasons. Uh, this is a little bit more. They use 46% absorbed. The earlier ones have 47. It doesn't really matter. It's according to what kind of surfaces you have here. But the idea is that the, the earth is heated from the sun. Um, underneath the surface is a very stable temperature. Okay. The goal is to utilize this large battery. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of look at it in terms of solar. This is a big battery. We can charge it and discharge it. And what we look at when we design is the instantaneous running the water into the ground and pulling it out, simple heat exchanger. We, we're trying to get somewhere between a 5 and 10 degree delta T when we come out of the ground. That's how much what temperature goes in and what temperature comes out. That's the key. And what we're looking to do is size this heat exchanger large enough to get that 6 to 10 degree change in temperature in and out of the ground. That's the basic design concept outside of understanding the ground and how it's going to charge up, discharge, and how this is going to last for a period of time. Okay? So all of these things is just a, for, for, I guess, the purpose of showing where the sun goes and how much of it is actually absorbed. So part of when you put energy in the ground or you put heat into the ground, some of it's going to dissipate. Uh, underground, there's water aquifers, there's things running, there's all different ways it dissipates. So it'll dissipate to other areas, and that's the goal. You want to make sure it dissipates during the short term, and then it will eventually, the heat will come back in, this will dissipate, and you'll take it back out of the ground. That's the goal of the final design. There's multiple different types of systems. Um, when you look at the four types of systems here, basically you have well water where you're actually using water from the ground. You have a pond system where you put this in a pond, you actually use the pond. Um, you have a horizontal loop system uh, that's really only been used for residential, small homes, maybe a couple tracks of homes have used those in the past. But this is really where the whole industry has gone. This is the only type of system I'll design anymore is 
a closed loop system where we drill holes um, anywhere between 100 to 400 feet. That's depending on some testing we do with test wells and to see what we're going to be drilling through. Um, the reason for these different heights can be anything from uh, water, water aquifers, large voids in the ground, to change in strata where we're going from uh, a shell, maybe we're hitting stone, limestone. There's different things you can hit when you're drilling. So we want to understand what that is and then sort of do a little economic analysis that says, do we keep trying to drill through that or do we just move and make it larger so we have shorter wells that, that end more of them? This system here um, has sort of lost its, its, its um, I, I, I guess, its popularity. And, and it's really due to what I said earlier that the water quality is the most important thing in the life of a system is that you don't end up with bad water in the system. It can foul things, it could uh, uh, corrode. When you have a closed loop, you're able to maintain that, you're able to monitor it, and you're able to water treat it, just like any closed loop system that you have. Uh, the pond system. One of the issues that you run with the pond system is it, 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 it's more of an instantaneous um, rejector and extractor of heat because water it will evaporate. It's almost like a large cooling tower you're making, closed circuit cooling tower. It, 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 it's a more inexpensive way to do it, but it's definitely harder to maintain. Um, we've, we've had where people have called us and said our system's not running, but we go out and we see two pipes flapping in the wind and it's just sucking water in and out. I said, you have an open system now. And they have foul water. Basically, this disappeared, broke away, whatever happened during the storm. So you don't, you're, you're sort of taking what I said earlier was the most important thing in your system and you're floating it out to sea. After the storms we just said, you could see people, boats were gone, all this was gone. Um, would you put your most important thing and just lay it in a pond or something like that? I would. So right now, my practice, we only design vertical loops. And that's the only one I would recommend uh, I'll use. Uh, so now I'm going to go away from the refrigeration, uh, water source heat pump. Everyone probably understands how a building operates that way. And now we're going to go into the construction. What can you look forward to when you're putting a system in? Um, it's a pretty messy, dirty construction site. Um, I, we have successfully done this on live campuses of universities where we don't go and put a field in. We'll just go and put individuals into buildings. Um, so when you end up getting to a system like that, you're only drilling one or two of these wells. You have a very small, uh, it's called a mess during the construction process. Um, that might be maybe as big as this area to put two wells in. Not too bad to do something like that. Um, this is more of a large scale site. Uh, this I believe was a school. Um, where they had a hill up the side and they put their whole well field in here. We generally put the wells in a grid. Um, can be anywhere from 10 to 25 foot separation according to the, the, the calculations we do, what the ground is, how the building's going to operate. Um, this one I believe was 15 feet and we circuit them. This is once you drill, basically let's go through the construction. You drill a well. Okay, you drop a pipe in. This pipe, um, go up to the next slide. Uh, one more. One more. Okay, this is the loop. This right here goes into the ground. Okay, you drill that original hole, and this comes completely um, tested and fabricated from the site. This is one real. These were 400 feet or 450 feet deep, I believe. Um, at the end, there's just a U-bend. It's all uh, 
fabricated at the factory. They come to the site charged so that you understand that when you get it and you take the charge off, if there's no charge in it, that goes back to the site. Part of, part of the warranty on these pipes. That'll go back to the factory. They'll send you a new one. Don't put that one in the ground. This uh, will then be put on a reel and it's dropped down the hole. At the same time, this is dropped down the hole. They drop a grout pipe down there and it's grouted completely from top to bottom. So when you are done with this, you have this pipe, which is as much part of the ground as it can be. Uh, one of the other uh, improvements that's been made over the years is the thermal conductivity and the, I, I guess you'd say, the sustainability of the grout that they use to put these pipes into the ground. They have higher thermal conductivity transfer between the pipe and the ground, and they're also more sustainable so they don't wash out or they won't disappear so they can have voids in it. But one of the things you, you which will hurt you is if you have a void in the the, the, the pipe diameter, which is generally about four inches, um, and there's nothing making contact between the pipe and the and the surface wall of, of the of the well. So that's one of the other things that that has improved greatly over the years. Almost every year, you have new companies coming out with this grout, different thermally enhanced, and and how they can uh, make this process better and last longer. So if you can just go back to the original. How are we doing on time? For Oops, I'm sorry. I will. Yeah, yeah I it's 10, 10 now. So it's okay, last thing. So basically, this is your ground, this is your circuits, this is your pipe, this is where they come into a building and are brought together, and then they just go to a pump. This is your drilling rig, which is a, a very messy process, but you can see a couple of pipes. Now, you just flip through I'll go quickly. It's another site. This is the rig. This is what you bring up from the ground when you're drilling. You can go further. That's the end. And this is a whole site. So this is all the drillings done. If you can see that was the street. This is the side of the hill. And then these are all going to be brought back together and brought into the building. That's just another how each circuit goes. And this is the final thing I want to say. When everything's said and done, you basically have grass parking lot. There's a site right here. It's uh, the senior building right over uh, Bernard Hankin Senior uh, Center. It, it's a it's a senior apartment building. It, the parking lot has this, the well field in it. That solar on the roof, that was done about 12 years ago, I believe. Um, and it's operating you know, great. You won't even notice, probably not many people even know that that is a geothermal site. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Sheila Wallace. I am the director of UV Greencastle. I cover Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware region, but we do uh, provide seed based financing throughout the country where seed base is approved. Um, so, quick timeline on UV and Recapital. Our co founders were uh, the Connecticut Green Bank. And so, what's cool about our company is we are actually really the policy and program leaders in this business. We have a huge team that goes from state to state to help enable this legislation and create these products for each state. The way it works, the state has to actually. Um, Approve legislation for the House and the Senate, and then have the governor sign it. And from there, you go into the municipality, municipality or county to county. So then you have the options. You actually can't utilize this program unless it's been approved and not do it. Um, to date, CPACE has financed over four billion in transactions for commercial assets. We have uh, we just hit the billion dollar mark last month for originations for UV Green Capital, previously Greenworks. Um, purchased by me. Uh, next slide there. There's one here if you'd like. Okay. Um, so what is CPACE? CPACE stands for Property Assessed Clean Energy. The point of the program is to help encourage energy efficiency. Um, it was created uh, 
because if you think about the energy, um, municipal leaders and legislative leaders all thought this might be a way to help um, encourage developers to start moving towards more clean energy. And this is actually a public benefit. And so um, they use the concept behind like uh, glorified sewer assessments where a municipality can go in and prove the sewer assessments along the streets or infrastructure and then fill it through their real estate tax. So the concept was property owners could utilize this um, for their own properties, commercial properties, and it's as it's a public benefit, they can then get paid back through their real estate taxes. Um, <laughs> um, so, moving to the next slide, please. Uh, so, currently, there's a little over 30 states that now have CPACE enabled. Um, here in Pennsylvania, it was enacted and enabled a couple of years ago, and then just in July, the governor signed an amendment to allow multifamily, which is a huge win because if you look at all the cranes in the sky, most of them are not for hotels, they're not for office buildings right now. <laughs> um, but we, we are using a lot for office buildings for retrofits and um, actually for distressed assets when they're struggling and they need a little extra cash flow, we can come in and do that. But um, so huge win for Pennsylvania. So it's active um, and approved for all asset types except for government owned buildings or um, assets that have are, are one to four unit residential buildings. So anything five plus residential or all other assets, nonprofits, um, industrial office, hotels, uh, all the above. Um, next page. <laughs> so the reason why it works is because it's long-term fixed rate financing. Uh, the way you calculate the length of the financing is by taking the estimated useful life of the L equal product. So if you're installing solar panels, for example, and their estimated useful life is 20, 25 years, um, you can actually fix this rate for that longer term, which will then lower your payment. And the idea is, you know, you could have this on the property for the life of the, the actual improvement. Um, here in Pennsylvania, uh, we, we've completed a couple uh, solar projects. We've completed a couple of retrofits and um, some ground up construction, which is really what is helpful right now um, in this environment, which I'll talk more about later. What's also neat is if you think about your own solar panels in your house. It's not, not approved for residential, but if you want to get solar panels and you're thinking you might be moving in four or five years and the payback period might be six years, for example, where you break even, it's, um, it's not so much of beneficial for you to spend all that upfront, upfront money. But because the CPA financing can run with the property, then you don't have that risk of, okay, I'm going to sell the asset in five years or so. Um, mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden lose all that money you invested in the front. So it's financed and the payments are going to stay with the property. So the owner who acquires it gets the benefit of the retrofits or the solar panels or whatever energy efficiency you just upgraded to. And then actually um, will also inherit the payments. Uh, next page, please. <laughs> if not, I can just think about what we're <laughs> Okay, so as I mentioned, um, there's really four main items you can finance. It's new construction that we have, energy efficiency, solar renewables, and um, the school is the, the um, legislative body as I'll realize it's just it's a great way to help grow jobs and grow economic development that they allow for this new construction and recapitalization. So in Pennsylvania, if you've done a project within the last 24 months, actually use CPAs to refinance it. Um, I already went through this, so I'm going to do that. So 
Um, the reason why it's beneficial is because historically, when you had a really low debt environment, you're able to get the developer more financing so that they didn't have to pay out as much equity. I would say today it's less the case because since interest rates have gone up substantially, the debt service coverage. So a bank will come in and underwrite it and say, <coughs> These fee based payments are part of my expenses, or I just have to make sure I underwrite them as, as something that's a little bit of a priority. So they call it split priority. Since we come in as a real estate tax, if the bank were to foreclose, they'd actually have to pay off real estate taxes to date. They're, they don't have to pay our whole loan balance off because it just stays with the property. They do have to pay whatever real estate taxes are due just like any other real estate tax. Um, and because of that, more recently, there's been less room for us to come in uh, where the bank feels comfortable that their debt service coverage might be constrained. However, because we are fixed rate at closing pre-construction, they do know that our interest rates can be set once construction is completed. And so we are able to get them a little bit more leverage today because our interest rates are often lower than what the bank financing uses as their analysis. So today, all banks are worried about are what's going to happen in three years, where interest rates going to be um, post construction? Are they going to be able to refinance or loan? So they're using these high interest rates, seven percent or higher, to do their analysis, which then cuts the proceeds that borrowers have today. So it's great with. See pace is you can come in and say they are in the six percent range. Um, just a month ago, it was in the five percent range, but um, it's still lower than what the banks are doing. So we can come in, replace some of the bank proceeds, and then give them a little bit more. <laughs> uh, so what's also really great, which I thought was important for the legislative bodies to pass two pace and I think a big part of the push to get done before they went to summer recess was the expected economic environment volatility coming up. Um, we often come in as rescue money. So during COVID, when there are hotels that were struggling or other projects that were struggling mid-construction, we would come in to help give them money to help pay for their operating costs to help reduce the senior lender's exposure um, or potentially come in for the gap financing if construction costs have gone up, right? And right now, things have been so volatile. Construction costs have gone up, interest rates have gone up, which means the borrower needs to make more money, um, and the banks are actually cutting their proceeds at the same time. So where's, where's that other money going to come from? Um, and that's where CPAs comes into play uh, and hopefully we'll be here in the next couple years if things do get a little shakier. Um, and actually, uh, <laughs> so okay, here's NPA. I think we uh, we mentioned about a project we did. Let me see. Uh, we did one Cascade, which was a ninety thousand square foot um, light manufacturing building. I to a picture of it, maybe not. Um, and it was a 1.19 megawatt rooftop solar, right? Um, what's cool about solar finance right now is a lot of our projects can actually pay for itself um, through the energy savings. Uh, I know Jim has done a lot of that already. <laughs> um, and actually, just want to let you guys know. We do have a group that does the power purchase agreement too. So here we're going to bring back a lot more specialized team that finances the solar and then also the different TPA structures if people want to go that route. Although, as you mentioned, it makes a lot more sense for your return if you plan to own the building, even if you don't plan to own the building, because if you get CPA steel cost financing in there, it still makes sense because then if you do want to return all rate of return. Um, standpoint to still uh, hold it yourself. Um, energy efficiency. So, what is covered 
and seed phase financing and anything that's energy efficient related for water production savings related. So if you think about insulation, windows glazing, um, lighting, roofing, solar boilers, HVACs, anything that you think of that has some sort of energy savings related component, you can finance. Um, the way it's done is different in each state and then within even Pennsylvania, it depends on which location. So in Philadelphia, you have the Philadelphia Energy Authority who runs the CPACE program. And I believe you have to be the code 2018 code, IECC code <laughs> as the baseline. Um, and then for the rest of the state with uh, sustainable energy fund, which we have Renee over there, um, it's 2015 you have to beat it by 10 percent, I believe, um, or something something along those lines. And if anyone has questions about it, you can always email me and I'll give you the details on it. But um, so if you beat those codes, you're able to finance it through the case. Um, and that's for ground construction or if you get rehab, if it's just a retrofit or it's something existing. Um, depending on the location, you either have to just implement or put it in a new item that is of greater energy efficiency. Um, and in some counties, you have to beat it by 20% or more. And then, sorry, go, go with the process is usually uh, a borrower comes to us, looks for some case financing, wants to know what the rate looks like, the term looks like, and how much they would be eligible for. And from there, we work with third party energy auditors to. Um, qualify them. So the only third party report that's required that a borrower has to pay for is a um, energy audit or an energy model, which they then will engage some of these contractors to go in, look at their proposed design. If they're not in their final design stages, they can they can use what's called like a um, prescriptive method where they can just put together what they need to be in order to qualify and the borrower has to go and certify and say that they're going to design and build to these qualifications and at the end of the process that you can have either like some sort of qualified engineer come in and then certify that they, they've done and built to those um, those levels of success. Um, so I'm here to speak also about these incentives, not my expertise. I think someone here's or Pico <laughs> that you can uh, get in touch with. But basically, in addition to using CPAs in the financing stack to improve these uh, these energy items, you can get substantial incentives uh, and savings. Here's a chart. <laughs> uh, so. Um, I believe there's some companies, a lot of the energy auditors that we use to, to uh, qualify CPAs can also go in there and help work with you on either a contracting basis or also um, sometimes like a percentage savings basis to help you get the energy savings. Um, I think it's, they have, go ahead. Okay. Um, so you're talking about the Pico Ways to Save program, which yes. is a program for commercial customers. Um, and so yeah, there is prescriptive incentives, but we also have new construction incentives. Okay. Um, and in a nutshell, we're looking for anything that is going to save KWH. Yes. So there is lots of people who will help you get through that process too. Um, so obviously I'm here to speak into the items that you can qualify for in the next page. And then, um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> if same you have concept. questions, same concept. Uh, there's lots of ways to um, save money by installing more energy efficient items. And as uh, Jim mentioned and pointed out, there's going to be way more even next year with the, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act. So it's going to be very beneficial. It's already beneficial to do your solar arrays here in PA. Uh, we've done multiple projects locally. It seems to make financial sense without those official incentives that are coming. Um, and of course, with the current economic environment, CPACE is a huge benefit because we are fixed rates at 
closing, which right now is is something that all developers or almost all developers and, and borrowers are running towards. If any questions, I think all of us are. Thank you. <laughs> Good, right? All right. Um, I, just to kind of sum it all up to, to part two, day two of a part one in part two series. And I think um, it was great. I mean, part one, I don't know, a show of hands, who was it part one? Okay, it's good. Um, we saw a lot of new faces for part two. But in part one, we, you know, we tackled half the net zero was sustainability studies, um, audits, metering, you know, how to how to initially look at a project as, as you start off on a path to net zero. Um, and we had, you know, great presentations. And then today, it was great, we wrapped it up with constructability, looking at geothermal design, solar, solar financing, and then an overall financing approach. So it kind of brings it all together. I think they did a great job. Uh, so start off with Q&A. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, I do. Hi, I'm Dennis Ray. Um, uh, I have two things going on, but one of them is for East Pikeland Township. And uh, I understand there's a question for Jim that uh, the reimbursements that you're talking about or credits are for nonprofits, but they can also be uh, applied or used by municipalities as well. Is that correct? Any nonprofit entity, including municipalities. Right. Then, additionally, um, you're saying that you can use those credits that apply for financing. Would you get some type of certificate or you certainly wouldn't get the money right away. You would get some kind of verification that you have this coming. And you can use that for applying for finance. Very important call out that yes, you presumably would have to put more capital out up front and then get some reimbursement. So you structure that with your financing lender uh, that's kind of some type of balloon payment uh, or, or um, financing would provide hopefully 100% the financing, but then as soon as that tax payment comes to you, we would reduce the financing from 100% down to 65%, 70%, or something like that. And then the amortization of that remaining <coughs> financing, those payments should be less than your initial cost. But yeah, you've got the concept. Right. Okay, thank you. So you're the solar guy, and you I talked about. Yourself, oh, uh, my name is Rick Mosley. I'm from. Uh, uh, Capital Village. Hi. Um, so are there, are there so there are massive incentives for solar in the IRA? Are there incentives along those lines for geothermal? Um, there is certain. I, I don't know all. But um, years past, they used to give uh, like New Jersey Smart Start. There was a couple other programs like that. They would give incentives to the geothermal in. Then it started to become not just pay for the geothermal, but go a step above that uh, to put a higher efficiency system and things like that. There, I don't know exactly what's available right yes, now yes, yes. Um, and, and, and how and how you actually, um, what you need to do in order to get that, what the entities are, but there, there is. Yeah, yeah, Scott's a designer, not a developer. Yeah. So, is there a geothermal developer? I mean, the answer is yes, right? I think geothermal got 30%. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, it's all. It's it's not unlike the solar benefits. And it's tiered, as Jim described, 30% plus yeah. another 10% plus. So, the range starts at about the yeah, It's interesting that Kevin mentioned. Um, Solar process. I think there's a lot of I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Tom Timmons, I think there's a because um, there you mentioned solar. We talked about S Rex. There's now G Rex in some very small areas like Montgomery County, Maryland, and down in the DC area. So we are seeing a lot of incentives come along. Also, you could almost reverse the order. I, I learned this this comment quickly on the synergies between geothermal and solar when you mentioned. Geothermal today normally can be, competes, excuse me, against BRF. When you think of a BRF system, you think of condensing units. I'm thinking like a multi-family type of thing. You think of condensing units all over the roofs, right? Um, when you do geothermal, you eliminate all that. So now your roof is virtually clean, no cooling tower, no condensing units. Now you can come in with your solar, and it's a great dynamic play 
one kind of like plays off off the other. Great way to get to zero. The last comment on the big time up Jim is I I personally and I'm sure everybody in this room will put down Jim Lockwood for 20 years of service. I have a number of personal experiences with Jim. He always comes through the court. So, thank you. Jim. Tom, I can confirm that the studies I've seen, the cost per BTU of energy is cheaper with geothermal, um, even as economic as solar. So absolutely, look at your options. If you can implement geothermal to lose your heating needs, um, do it. <laughs> if it works your facility, then you still have electricity needs for other aspects of solar could be so a layered approach. But yeah, geothermal is extremely cost effective. Any questions over there? Yeah, um, it's more of a statement. I'm Kirk Reinbold. I'm a West Vincent Township resident. I'm with the West Vincent Clean Energy Transition Team. I know there are several folks here. Jim came to our community today. It was great. Um, but I'm working with Dennis Ray of East Pikeland. We have West Pikeland, and we have Schuylkill, which is funded by uh, Rachel here at uh, Chester County Sustain um, Planning Commission. She's the Sustainability Director. Mm -hmm. New. Congratulations. <laughs> um, but what we're trying to do is something that's a little different. We're dealing with residents, we're dealing with a rural township. We got some farms like folks at Camp Hill. Um, so everything you guys are talking about is absolutely great. But we need to get this conversation to the people that live in these areas. So I'm reaching out to everyone here. Contact us, maybe maybe through Jim, because we have potential demonstration projects in the school district, the library, and the farms all over our north, northern Chester County area. And we're actually using Paul here at Spot Stevens mm -hmm. to help us develop our clean energy transition plan. Um, so we're trying to be kind of a, you know, a, a bright light in Chester County to try to actually educate people because we can get to net zero, but we got to get the people to understand which you guys all know. And the finance is very important right now. Because they don't know this stuff. You guys know it. We need to get it to the people like Brain Ant or something like that and be able to really explain this. So I'd love to talk to you guys more about how we can do that together. Because if we can get that area done, we can spread it down south. Thanks. Are those demonstration projects going to be like the RFP out or how, how are they doing that? How are we doing that? That's part of the planning, I guess, that's going on. Yeah, so yeah, yeah that's great. But you, you can help me figure out how to do an RFP. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that's that's where we are. There's a there's a disconnect. Paul knows how to do RFP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello, Cheryl Kramer, Community Support. I should say commercial solar. I have a question for you, Jim. You mentioned that battery energy storage is more commonplace. How's the recycling going? Is that going to get better in the near future, or is that still going to be kind of more far future? Sure, a lot of people ask that question about solar panels, what happens when we went from that, and now with batteries and um, all kinds of things in there. I am not an expert on that topic. I do know that uh, there are a lot of recycling programs uh, either available or in the works, and these materials that are included in silicon, aluminum, and other parts are, are quite valuable. Uh, I'm, not, I do not, I'm not aware of solar panels being dumped in landfills or batteries. My understanding is that there are car recycling programs. Yeah, I, I Dennis Ray again, another question. Uh, and that is about the domestic content issue. Uh, up until recently, 90% of all the solar panels were constructed, made, you know, offshore. Uh, how is that going to change, or do you see that changing here in the near future with uh, to since, meet that requirement? Since IRA has been passed, there have been a whole series of announcements of manufa solar manufacturers, inverter manufacturers, racking manufacturers. Um, I'm a, like a cheerleader of this policy for creating American jobs. Uh, it's 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 such a long-term program. Um, when we talk about 30% or more, uh, is a 10-year or more program. Um, it only starts phasing out once the uh, U.S. gets a certain percent of its energy by renewable energy. So it might last longer than 10 years. Um, and that gives the economic certainty for these manufacturers to say, hey, this is really happening here. So yeah, it's it's uncertain in the next, in the immediate future, but two, three years out, we really think there's going to be a path for domestic content. 
wanted to bring up a point on actually one of your slides. Um, one of the biggest, I think, benefits of CPAs is does the owner actually keeps on an S on a solar project keeps the SREX and all the tax benefits, unlike the PPA. I mean, most the PPA is worked by them taking all those credits and that that's the case. Yeah, they do. They get all those incentives. Um, if they own it, then they can sign it with the PPA, and then they can even they would like I said sell the project. They can even just get tax on those improvements through the next ten years, which is beneficial, especially in an interest rate rising environment. And if they say five percent, so a lot for Got questions out there? So a couple things. Glad you brought up the certainty, the 10-year programs that are coming out compared to what we've had in the past, which are two and three year programs. That they're far more financeable now because of that certainty. Uh, and refinance, with rates going up right now, is refinance really off in the future for when rates drop? We'll see the refi of projects. So, you know, it depends on the state for how long they allow you to refinance it. So, 24 months here in Pennsylvania, actually, Delaware, you can go further back, but you have to reduce your loan term by that type of time. So, if it's five years previously installed, their loan term drops to 25 months longer. But if your refi is the same rate where can you find refi at a lower rate than what past rates have been in the last 24 months? That's doubtful. So how what's the spread versus yeah. the duration? So let's say you have a 10-month loan now and you get to a 30-year loan under CPAs, right? Yeah. What's the spread that people yeah. are looking so for? So right now I will say um we are actually pricing inside most of the senior vendor rates. Historically, maybe six to ten years, ten months ago, we were a little bit higher. Um, and so they only used us to get additional leverage or if they were able to finance a hundred percent of the project um, for retrofit solar panels or energy efficiency through CK. Um, but since we are pricing inside of a lot of say rates these days, uh, people are now choosing to do CKs instead, right? And then because it's fixed, they know what their long term rates will be. But it's also prepayable. So not only do you have the uh, ability to have this long term fixed rate that you can pass on to subsequent owners or to the owner for the rest of the project, um, you also have the ability to potentially prepay after a certain amount of years. So if interest rates do fall back down um, or if you get Money through incentives or credits, whatever it is, you can then pay your loan down, and that's that's an issue. Keeping on time, I love being on time. But one more, do one more. Okay, um, a multifamily dwelling, uh, apartment building, um, let's say five units, and there's ample room to put several hundred kilowatt uh, solar system on the roof, but the tenants are individually built. So how does the owner of the facility recoup that money? I mean, yeah. is it a community solar thing? That no. they sell? I mean, so how it does makes that... it, it makes it more challenging for CPAs for multifamily for that reason. Whereas if you did that for an office building, a lot of times the office tenants pay for the real estate taxes, so they have that agreement. For multifamily, um, you know, there is a lot of hesitation even allowing CPAs because uh, some of the affordable housing advocates do not want them to um, increase their rents because of that, but they're actually saving money, right? So in the end, the way it would work would be that the, the borrower would then potentially increase rent um, because now the, the borrower, the owner of the building has to absorb 100% of the savings, right? Even though they're not going to have benefit of it. And so the only way they can recoup it is by saying, Next year, you know, or they have to come up with some agreement with the tenants to, to say, you know, their costs are going to be down. So it makes it harder to incentivize a multifamily owner to do those retrofits for that that reason. I would agree, and uh, we have done.
done multifamily units in North under community solar. Uh, can you do it in, in Pennsylvania? Yeah, but you have to kind of retrofit some of the electrical systems and it gets, uh, gets expensive. But I like, by the way, your comment about partnering uh, with this. These projects are very much a team, team effort. <laughs> There's so many different mm -hmm. uh, layers. And, uh, you know, I don't think I ever said that you know, we do financing, but we primarily you know, design and then we'll build and we'll finance. But we're all about partners. 90% of our projects have come through other partners. So we'd love to talk to everybody and figure out how to partner with them because that's what's needed. Right. For collective effort. <laughs> give me your card. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's give these guys a round of applause. We'll have one more or two more announcements. Coming up this month is Energy Efficiency Day. Also, World Geothermal Energy Day is October 17th. Celebrate with all your staff. Have lunch. Go out after work. Shout out to your well drillers. Your geothermal guys, shout out to your well drillers on World Geothermal Energy Day. <laughs> www.geothermalenergyday.org. So th thank you very much for uh, for coming out this morning on a rainy day. A couple of wrap up comments. Um, again, please put your badge on the um, easel out there. Uh, saves us a couple of dollars in each of the nice magnetic signs and things of that nature. Uh, we actually save them with your name in it so we can recycle them for when you come back for the next event. Uh, I also wanted to let you know you, you will be getting the survey. Love to have your input. There's also a line in there. If you have an idea for future topics or you'd like to present in the future, let us know. If you can bring the general public to a place, I'll find you the speaker for whatever topic you want. We've tried to go to the general public over the years in the past, and we think, okay, all the businesses that we deal with, most of them are homeowners, but they would never respond to our emails coming out. So if you can bring the general public, we'll bring the experts to you. Well, I got a supervisor here. <laughs> and, and we have Rachel. <laughs> right. La lastly, how, how many people are working for a company that is hiring? Okay. So the headline today, just a couple moments ago from the uh, Department of Labor, is the number of jobs openings decreased. Big headline. However, it decreased from 10.2 million open jobs in July to 10.1 million <laughs> in July. So, so we are still hiring. There are still job openings. Uh, there is a task force here at the Economic Development Council that I'm still uh, also involved with called Hire One. Again, there are no placement fees, but if you have openings, we are planning our next business networking event for November, the date to be determined, where we literally put employers and job seekers in a room, no resumes allowed, beer, wine, and food. The employers have a different type of name badge, and we instruct the job seekers to go up to the employer and say, Bill, why are you here? What is it you're looking for? And why they might not be an HVAC technician with the desire to learn geothermal, probably somebody in their phone is interested in that okay and they literally share, take, take out their phones and share their contacts and go from there so come up to me i'll hang out let me know love to get you on on that mailing list as, as well again future topics please let us know if you're interested in any of the other partnerships that i mentioned earlier uh in regards to uh, it and agriculture healthcare, and manufacturing again they're all free to join i mentioned gary smith earlier gary's in the back our president and CEO, if the things we did, I know more than half the room is new, first time here at the council. So we'll hang out, we're here to answer your questions. Thank you so much, goodbye. <laughs> there is some food and uh, coffee out there without a dreamer. Okay. 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 So we have another for the Oh, I 